Welcome to the Fishing Daily Podcast with me, Oliver McBride. Today I'm joined by Patrick Murphy from the Irish South and West, and we will be talking about the uh, decommissioning scheme. Um, Patrick, welcome. Hi, Oliver, and hello to your viewers. How are you all? Good, thank you. Patrick, uh, BAM has written to 57 of the Irish fishing vessels, offering them the Brexit Voluntary Permanent Cessation Scheme or the Decommissioning Scheme as we better know it. Now, the offer doesn't seem to be what the fishermen want. Yeah, well, look, to, to easily put this in context, I would not call it the Voluntary Decommissioning Scheme. I would call it the Government uh, Fisheries Abuse Scheme and the Victim Scheme uh, 100%. We, uh, the Irish South and West, have Many interviews I'd say I've had with you and others said that the criteria and the way that this was going to be imposed was not fit for purpose. We uh, said this inside the task force. We asked for our objection and why we could not support the scheme as it was written, the decommissioning scheme, as it was written, because I, I had seen the previous um, criteria of, of previous scheme where it was only for 16 million to get rid of 30 votes. And, uh, once I heard that it was going to follow on the same criteria, I said, no, no this isn't going to work. Uh, certainly not. This is a totally different scenario and a situation in comparison to any other decommissioning scheme. This came about because the noise we made as an organisation of the treatment we got from Europe. This came about because we threatened and asked for the resignation of one of the top uh, DG Mary directors for the comment that was made the reason why we lost so much fish in the unfair TCA deal was because of our proximity to the UK uh, which I found incredible now they explained afterwards that it wasn't our proximity it was the proximity of the stocks in relation to the UK and unfortunately they wanted more of ours than anybody else's namely mackerel and uh, the nephrops so they were the two biggest hitters for us and whether the UK wanted them or not there was easier ways of balancing the books um, to allow us to pay uh, in proportion the same as everybody else I'm not going to go into that so people will remember that we had a very low morale inside our fishing fleet in 2020 this was a Christmas present that was given to us and one of the ways that South West um, addressed this was we gave an outlet for our members and rather than blocking ports or creating uh, disturbances, whatever else, we decided to tell the public uh, our story. And we did that by taking our boats up the rivers, uh, two main rivers in the country, to two of the biggest cities, uh, Cork and Dublin. And we made sure, and I mean this, and, and it came to pass now, in our banners, we had, we don't want compensation, we don't want money, we don't want decommissioning. What we want is fish to continue to make our living on the sea. That's it. And all that, that, that's what we want. We pointed out how wrong it was. Yet, when the task force was set up, three key elements was spoken about. Rebalancing the burden, getting more fish back, um, tie-up schemes for a temporary um, solution. And the final and last one was decommissioning. And if you didn't get one of the other two, we all knew there wasn't enough there for us to survive. The, the plate of food was reduced by 25% and the people around that were sharing it before that were, were all going to starve. Simple as that, there wasn't enough fish. The study proved that from the BIM and it actually even identified in the different areas of the fleet, from saners to trawlers to, to gill netters to pelagic boats in, in the um, polyvalent section to beamers. And it named the size of boats and everything that should be taken out into different categories to return a viable future for the boats that would be left. Instead, all that was chucked out the window and it was done on a crazy methodology of competing neighbour with neighbour, which I find deplorable, to be honest with you. And so the rest of the fishermen I have in this organisation. To say to one guy, Jesus, you caught a lot of fish now and because you caught a lot of fish, I'm being punished for it and I'm getting less money. And at the same time, the man that may have caught all that fish then is told nothing whatsoever to do with the objectives of the scheme. Your boat is over 30 years of age, so we're going to claw back 15%. Oh, by the way, 
uh, the fuel subsidy that the minister had given us in the tie-up scheme. Well, that really wasn't a, a, a tie-up scheme for fuel. Uh, it was just a tie-up scheme. And now you're going to pay that back as well, too, <clears throat> um, because uh, Europe wants it back. Like, this is scandalous, what's going on here. And, and, and just to explain, anybody that's watching this, ask yourselves, are you a victim of the common fishery policy? And I would say, most would say, yes, we don't get enough fish. We have the biggest fishing ground. Uh, other countries from outside the European Union are coming and catching fish four and five times. Of course, the common fishery policy doesn't look after us. We're a victim of it. That's one. Are you a victim of Brexit? I don't think anybody's going to argue with that one. Every single fisherman in this country is a victim. Now, that's twice. And the third one, are you a victim of the war in the Ukraine? Have you suffered because of that? Are you a victim? Of course we are. The price of fuel shot up and people's livelihoods were affected. And trying to get crews and everything else to stay on board boats, you're a victim. So you're a victim of three different key areas, right? And what makes it worse then is the solution that was given by our government and the European Union was pay us off, right? And what do they do? They make you a victim for the fourth time. Like, Talk about abuse of your own citizens. And for what? Over money? So here's the simple facts. The scheme identified 8,000 tons had to be removed from the active register to allow 35 million worth of fish to be returned to the boats that were left. 35 million. That's a lot of money. Now, talk about value for money, right? Within three years, that fish would total 105 million. Three years, you get your money back, right? So when they said 12,000 per GT, I said, not at all. That's crazy. In the task force, I presented evidence where boats were bought just before Brexit and even after the announcement of Brexit for 14,000 upwards to uh, 17 and 18,000, right? No question. No arguing from anybody in the commission. It was accepted that the evidence I put forward was correct. Yet I was told we needed a, a value for money scheme. Like, talk about it, value for money. You're forcing people out of their industry and now you have to get value for money adapted. So what that meant is screw you fishermen, abuse you fishermen, victimize you fishermen. And I'll explain why. 8,000 tons at the value they put on it at 12,000 is 96 million. So how can you bring in a scheme when you value the scheme at its top money is 96 million? So the, to show your intention, the minimum you look for is 96 million. You're not counting any contingencies or rising in prices or anything like that or any unforeseen circumstances or maybe an, an extra subscription to the scheme that you might have to accept. Otherwise, you'd be discriminating against boards, right? And instead, our minister got 63. Like, who's cutting who? That's one third of a reduction. One third. Just short of it, actually. Just short of one third. So that means the maximum you're going to give is around 8,000 on average per GT. And that's the average. So you give somebody 10, and you have to take, that's two over the average. Somebody else of the same amount has to take two off, you go down to six. And that's the reality. And that's exactly what happened. So regardless of how they picked out who fell into which category, as I said, this is victimization, dividing our industry once again. And I'm asking people who watch this, if you're one of the 57, for God's sake, one time, I'm asking for solidarity. Go into the meeting the next day, think about what will be presented to you and look at your fellow fishermen and see, why should I get more than him or he get less than me or whatever else? Stick together. If you're being offered more by what we're putting forward the next day, that's all you should be concentrating on. And stick to that. And worry about your own business, what you can get for that. And that would be my message to those people. And unity. If you don't have unity, you're done. And everybody needs to come together on this. So that's what I'm asking for. And no point to talk about any other topics. This is the topic. This is being facilitated by the Irish South West supported by the other producer organizations and we would like to see people outside of the organizations coming to this meeting and you'll all be treated the same you'll all be given the same opportunity to speak there 
And hopefully after the meeting, we've invited the minister. We've invited the um, head of the um, money, the operational program, the MFF, um, the department official. And we've invited the current chairman of BIM, who happens to be the chairman that was over the task force, to come to and speak with the fishermen after our meeting. Now, this is a closed meeting. Anybody can come to, to Limerick. We're not going to stop anybody. But we would hope that they would respect that fishermen are nervous as it is. They don't want to be going into a room and stuff being reported on them or being targeted afterwards. And if anybody thinks, oh, they won't be targeted, not living in the real world with me anyway. So I believe that these people need as much protection as possible. They need to go into the room themselves, discuss it themselves, formulate their own opinion and their own plan going forward. Um, I'll be there to help and assist, uh, like I always am. And uh, that's where I come from. But I don't have a board for decommissioning. So this is all I can do for you. I've done my best up until this. And at least I can show categorically we as an organisation didn't support this scheme. We knew what was coming. We said it from the start. Unfortunately, we've been right in Brexit and a few other issues. And we're going to continue to be right because we can see what's happening here. And this is your opportunity. Don't let it happen. Don't go out without a fight. Um, come to this meeting. Hear what has to be said. Join together. And let's bring this to the media. Let's tell Ireland what's going on here. Now, remember, we've had uh, interviews with uh, French TV. That's gone out on Christmas Day and we did a 10 minute, um, there's going to be a 10 minute program on Brexit and decommissioning and the effects on uh, Castleton Bear and members of the fishing community here. And that's going to be on Euronews uh, Thursday night. I think it's airing around 7.30, but it might be a li little bit later. I'm not quite sure, as but it will be on Thursday evening and maybe tune in probably in a foreign language, but we'll put on the subtitles. We do, do the best we can. Um, but if all of Europe is interested in what's happening to us, I can assure you, the Irish people will too. And this is an extinction event for many ports and harbours around our country. We're going to see fishing erased. Erased, and that, that is a tragic thing to be saying in 2023, with rich, abundant fish around our fishing grounds. And, and we know it ourselves, lads. There's plenty of fish outside there. The hard work was done to restore these fish into the area. And it's crazy now that we're asked to get out of the fishing grounds to allow other uh, fishing fleets to come in and reap the rewards and the benefits. And that's why we were in Brussels this week, um, me and my industry colleagues fighting to make sure that, uh, like in the map behind us here, that anybody inside this area here will have to pay for it. They're not coming in here for free and that other countries in Europe will benefit from it. It's that simple. So, look, Wednesday we would appreciate as many people coming to this as possible and Thanks, Oliver, for allowing us to get out the message here. Patrick, what time is that meeting starting at on Wednesday? So we, we, we've booked the room from 2 to 6. Um, so people can turn up from 2 to 6. But the closed meeting starts at 3 o'clock. And we're hoping it'll take two hours max. And uh, we'll finish the meeting then. And we're hoping that the minister and the BI, uh, BIM uh, that we invited and the department official will be there to meet these people afterwards. Um, if they're not, it'll just show what, what, what the government and our department and BIM think of our fishermen. This is um, their exit of the industry that maybe four or five generations before of them were in. And surely be to God, the least they're entitled to is a hearing. You were in Europe last week. You were speaking to um, people in the European Commission. Were you speaking to them about this decommissioning scheme and, and what was the reaction? Oh, 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 look, let, let's be under no illusion here. The reason why we were in Brussels was to point out to them the, the hurt that was done to us and the promises that were made to me and my colleagues when we went to Brussels. Uh, we were taken out there, in fairness, by Chris McManus and Patrick McLaughlin. They, they brought out a delegation outside there and we're very grateful for it. And a, and a big delegation. You were part of it yourself, Oliver. And, and it gave us a chance to meet the Commission, even the ones that weren't too happy seeing me there because of what I said. Um, but anyway, we got to meet them. We got to put our case across. And one of the things that the commission did, and, and they are honouring it. I, I, I always be honest about these people. I might be the best of friends, but when they do something right, I always acknowledge it. And they're doing it right now. Um, and that is find a mechanism that we can make ourselves whole again, that, that we can, uh, you know, 
mitigate some of the, the losses from Brexit. We're, we're doing that. And and in fairness, the Commission are standing by us and they've held up the Norway EU negotiations despite the pressure from five or six different countries who, as I said, it would be some going that they would abuse us again twice, once in Brexit and now to take our fishing grounds from us and the fish inside it to their better uh, their betterment and um, and we get nothing for it. It wouldn't happen in their waters, let's put it this way, so I don't and I, I think they know, I think they understand it. Look, access has to be paid for, whether Norway pays for it or whether our own fellow EU countries pay for it. It doesn't matter to me who pays, as long as somebody pays. We have established beyond any shadow of a doubt that this is a new access, despite the deal that was done in 2021 and 2022 um, to allow the access in. I wasn't part of that negotiations. I certainly wasn't. I know there was a big deal made of it coming back from Brussels and how great the negotiations were. I didn't agree with that. Um, I, absolutely not. A couple of thousand tonne for access to the richest waters in Ireland. Um, catching hundreds of thousands of tonnes. Uh, doesn't add up for me. So, look, the industry has come together now on this and we're standing firm together and we've laid out our stall and we're looking for more fish. But Oliver, like, this is for one section of the fleet. Um, we have to find a mechanism where all the sec sections of our fleet gets the benefit from increases. So, you know, let's get the fish first and then start the conversation after that. But, you know, there's there's many more boats um, hurting in Ireland from the smallest five metre, seven metre punt uh, upwards. And despite what people might think of me, I try and look after every vessel every operator, no matter what they're catching, whether they're in my PO or outside, um, might be too popular in my own PO sometimes for that, but they took me on under those conditions. Um, of course, my own members come first and uh, uh, they know the work that I put in for them. So I don't think they'd be um, giving out too much about what I just said. But uh, as an industry, we need to unite. We tried and we did succeed in doing that in Dublin, bringing all the boats together and all the POs, but we won't get anywhere if we don't have unity. And and I hope people will understand that. And that has to happen um, going forward. Like we really need to look after each other because there's very little left. You know, we're, 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 we're being wiped out. And um, if anybody doesn't realize that, they need to look around themselves. And um, it's not good. It really isn't good. You know, I, I often remember my father saying to me on a bad day when we were going out into the bay, then he would say to me, like, you know, it, it's it's a tough enough environment. When you go out there and there's no boats around you, it's even tougher. When you get into trouble, there's nobody there to lend you a hand. So you'd like to see somebody somewhere near you that can come to you if the worst happens. And um, those numbers are dwindling right around the coastline. And I think it's... Uh, it's, it's dangerous. And I think for the jobs ashore and everything else and people that we need to, to service our industry, if you bring the boats down to a critical mass that doesn't pay them, they'll start to disappear very quickly as well. And then you're going to be in a real world of hurt, you know. So that's that's all of it, really. Well, Patrick, I suppose one, one more question as the Minister, Minister Charlie McConnell received a lot of criticism last week for an interview he did and the Aries Examiner, where he seemed to point out that he was doing a very good job for the fishing industry. Would you like to comment on that? So um, you have to give acknowledge when somebody's doing something right for them, because you'd be hoping with that um, acknowledgement and that assurance and backup that they look to do more of it. And that would be where I am. Everybody likes a pat on the back now and again. So our minister, Charlie McConnellogue, deserves a lot of credit for what he's done with the Norwegians. And taking on the Danes as well too looking for that mackerel you know he's he's fought for the spur dog um, quota as well too so these are areas that show that this man is definitely willing to help out the industry the criticism in, 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 the, in the thing I think he could do a lot more um, you know and, and of course maybe I'm being greedy on that so the interview yes um, and some of the things that he said I wouldn't be 100% in agreement with and maybe a bit far lower than that. But he is our minister. He's the man to make the decisions. I have to meet him around the table. I give out about him enough most of the times. 
Um, I'm hoping he'll listen to what's happening here with the with the decommissioning. No excuses. The um, 96 billion, that's what was put to the commission. That was in the report. So uh, they knew beforehand. It's just sad, I'd put that word on it, that our department didn't go over and look for the sanction for that under the state aid. They had all the figures to show that they were correct in asking for it. And I don't think they would have got a, a no. I think they would have been supported 100% from the people that I speak to in the commission. Um, they wanted to sort some of this out. And when they had given the 1.2 billion, um, allocating 96 million of that to take out a third of the fleet, uh, I don't think would have been a hard ask. Look, we see the French and other people getting fuel aid. And for the minister then, that, that's one bugbear that I have with the minister. There was five and a half million there. He should have given it out. I'll never change my opinion on that, especially coming up to Christmas and boats and all the bad weather. It would have been a real help to families coming into Christmas instead of building up debts like I know a lot have coming into the new year and now a bad January again and the debts getting there, especially self-employed fishermen. It's a no-brainer to help out when you can, especially when it doesn't affect anybody else. I still don't know where that five and a half million has gone to. Um, could the minister be better advised? I would hope so, because I think the industry is giving him the right advice, and I just it it confounds me. Why wouldn't you listen? I'm not. I don't get anything. If the fisher, if the if the minister gives aid to a fisherman, unfortunately, I'm no longer a fisherman. I'm asking for somebody else. You know. So I get nothing out of it. I genuinely don't. My wages don't go up. I, I, what happens to me is it puts a smile on my face. It helps my mental health and it helps me feel I've achieved something by getting more for, for the lads I represent and those outside of our organisation. So that's what it would have meant for me. But for the people where it would have gone to, it would have been huge. Like, And I know people that are in trouble here. I know people that are struggling. Genuinely, I do. And I'm not making it up right. And this is just a small token that he could have given. So and that part of the interview, that's where I would disagree with it. And I'd still like to know where that five million went. Did they actually give it back to the European Union? I will be asking that question later on in the year when I go to the first operational programme, the monitoring committee for these funds. And I will be asking the commission and everybody else, where did that money go to? And if that money went into control or something else, I'd say, well, there you go. There's no appetite here to help fishermen. You're out to crucify fishermen. You're trying to, you know, destroy them. It's as simple as that. And Oliver, we've had this conversation about what a fisherman has to do. I, I think it'd be no harm. Um, and my request to you, ask the SFPA to come on with you. Ask them what does a boat have to do? How are they monitored? What is the process and, and, and the sequence of events that a fisherman has to comply with and, and how he can be checked and the different agencies that can, that can um, come down aboard a boat and demand to get into the boat to access and, and do an inspection on them? So we we'll start with the SFPA, the guards, the WRC, the uh, health and safety. Um, am I missing somebody? The Navy. You know, um, is there more? That's five. Oh, MSO, six. Like, you know, and they can come at any time. I, I find it incredible people say that there isn't enough monitoring going on for the fishing industry. You have to tell the FMC when you're leaving within four hours or change your departure time if you fall out at that time. You have two monitoring systems on board the boat. The AIS is a voluntary one. It's there for um, safety for boats to find them faster. It's it's not a control measure or a requirement under the CFP, but the VMS is, right? And you can't tamper with that. You have an electronic, electronic logbook. You have to have a whole plan. You have to know where you're fishing, when you fish, log the fish in a certain area, and you have to update that data before midnight every day. You are um, obliged to welcome on board either um, our own SFPA on board the boat or Navy, or they can come on board the SFPA on board an EFCA vessel. A foreign vessel can come in. If you're in UK waters, you can be searched by them. Um, 
when you are out at sea, as I said, you have to fill in your logbook before midnight. And uh, again, subject at any time for inspection. You have to um, book in four hours before you can land and close your logbook, which I'm uh, questioning because my colleagues out far and says that's illegal. You can't close your book until you're inspected. So there seems to be a discrepancy there between our own and, and, and them. Um, you have to come in then, um, and as I said, somebody might inspect you. They don't have to. They can follow the fish into the factory. They can inspect it there. They can inspect it in the lorry um, under the uh, landing obligation. And uh, the weighing, no, you still have to take your fish out of the box and, and be subject to a certain amount of sampling without ice and water. Um, you have cameras inside the factory, cameras on the pier. You have your sales notes and uh, everything is monitored. You know, how much more do you need or want to monitor a fisherman? You know, and as I said, like it, it, multiple agencies of the state come on board and, and check out multiple different areas of your business. So maybe that's something that you might consider is bring in one of these guys if they'll come on well, board. It's and, definitely and it's an open invitation it. for the anybody yeah. from the SFPA who wants to come on and talk to us about it because it's one of those things that the people, people the public should know what the SFPA does and what how the fishermen have to put up with. Uh, Patrick, our time's nearly up here. Thank you. Uh, what I want to do is I want to thank you very much and I just want to remind everybody uh, so the meeting is on at the Radisson Blue Hotel in Limerick on Wednesday, the 18th of January, between two o'clock and six o'clock. Yes, but we were in the room, Oliver. Yes. It's just the 57 because just they're the, the ones that are affected. Yeah. That's the discussion. So we have no problem with people coming before or afterwards as long as they don't interfere with the meeting. Now, maybe 57 won't turn up, but how many of them do? They need the privacy to be inside there to speak freely, right? Mm -hmm. They are the ones that have are being affected by this. I'm not. Well, I am. Um, my organization will lose members. Um, the co-op here, I read in one of the articles, I wasn't speaking to John Nolan, but he believes out of his membership of just over 40 boats, all 19 are members of the co-op. So like that is devastation for the Castledown Bear co-op. Like that is, that, that, I, that's scary. Like I'm not losing half my members, but I will be losing a lot of members. But that's down to the organization here to try and fight it and keep going like you know and uh, you know it's 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 scary times for for anybody in the industry but for these families who have invested all their lives oh there is one thing oliver actually i just want to point this out to people now for anybody yeah, else outside the industry this is an easy way to explain how bad this system is right one of these boats outside the window here that we brought up to dublin or our, our, our park when you step on board, they're the most modern of vessels, right? They have the best equipment, best of everything else. So those vessels stand alone, right, are worth between 300,000 to a million. That, that's between the boats that are there that are being decommissioned, in my, in my estimation. They might be a bit lower for some of the smaller boats now, but we'll say that the, definitely the, the majority are 300,000 to a million. They'll be lucky to get 15,000 from the scrapyard for those vessels. Now, that is a criminal sin when we're told to reuse, recycle. We have to be in, in, in the blue economy and, and turn things around. It's a bloody disgrace and, and nothing short of it. But that will tell the ordinary punter outside. If you think these fishermen are getting a deal, think about what I've said. They are not. Their livelihoods, their boats are being undervalued and they're being told to leave the industry. And they cannot get back into the industry for five years. Five years, that's part of the scheme. Five whole years. Well, it'll be interesting to see what the meeting brings. And hopefully we'll have you back, Patrick, and we'll, we'll have a, a, a chat. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's a lot goes on in our industry, Oliver. And, and to be honest with you, you know, uh, six years, seven years I'm into this now, seven years uh, since the uh, 11th of January, and grateful for every day that the lads have allowed me to represent them, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, it's a case that I'm, I'm at my tethers in now. Like, you know, I, I, I can't 
not know what's going on in the industry, but I need our minister and the department to listen to us. 